kind of look at what has happened uh, uh, as a consequence of the Spanish-American War. Uh, specifically, you know, kind of analyzing uh, the U.S.'s rise to power. So what I'd like to do is start off by uh, having a conversation, because what we're doing today is having a conversation. I'm not lecturing. Uh, I want this to be a dialogue. Uh, so I'm going to start by introducing uh, uh, theory, international relations theory, so that we can have a, a, a filter, if you will, to, with which to analyze you know, the, the events that have taken place uh, since the Spanish-American War and uh, the War of Cuban Independence and, and, and those events. So I'll start off by speaking about these <coughs> theories specifically, realism, liberalism, constructivism, and Marxism, specifically dependency theory. Then I'm going to give a, a, a broad overview of what's happened in the international system um, since the Spanish-American War. Uh, speaking of what's ha what was happening before, just to have a context. Then I'm going to have you guys kind of separate into groups. And each, each group will, will use a different filter to analyze those events that have taken place. After that, I'd like to focus on Latin America, on, on the Western Hemisphere, and see what specifically has happened uh, in, in our hemisphere uh, since the Spanish-American War. Then, uh, if time permits, and it will, um, uh, another uh, in-class exercise where uh, we, we kind of analyze uh, what's become of the, the, the foreign territories that were at play after the Spanish-American War. And then after we conclude that, then I want to take a couple minutes to talk about um, the, the research and teaching modules. Uh, my feeling is that most of you are going to do your writing over the next three or four days since you have the time. So I just want to make sure that that we're on the same page as far as the research is concerned with the research designs as to what I'm looking for so that you, you have something in mind. So I'm going to actually show you some samples <coughs> that you can uh, you know, use and emulate as, as you uh, get down to business. And I'm sure James may also have a couple of words regarding uh, the teaching uh, modules and and maybe some announcements for uh, next week. All right, so uh, let's begin. Uh, in international relations, uh, there really is no main theory that helps us understand everything that happens in the international system. Uh, we depend on a handful of different theories to understand different aspects of what goes on. Having said that, Realism, political realism, is the dominant theory in international relations. And political realism can't be discounted. Even if you don't agree with it, you have to understand its importance in the international system. So I'll start talking about realism and give you some tenets or some assumptions that realists make. The first assumption about realism is that states are rational actors. So this is a, a, a rationalist approach or theory. What's a rational actor? Exactly. A rational actor is someone who acts in their own self-interest. We're all rational actors, right? At least that's the assumption. We all act and our self -interest. <laughs> The second assumption that, that, that realism makes is that you can't, or, 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 or what states or individuals intend is hard to decipher. It's very subjective to try to understand the motives 
or the intentions that states or other actors have. So you have to base what you understand on observation. So behavior and observation is important in realism. In other words, realism is focused on objective, not subjective meaning. So it has to be observed. Some assumptions that realism makes about the international system is one, that the international system is anarchic. And what does that mean, that the international system is anarchic? We're not talking about anarchy as you know, the anarchists of, uh, of, of France and Europe and Cuba that were, you know, anti-government type of, uh, of uh, uh, ideologues. That's not what anarchy means in this context. Does it mean that there's not one world order? Yes. Natural? It's a lack of government. It's a lack of government. The international system lacks a hierarchy. And I always tell my students when I give this lecture about realism in class, I tell them, if you're walking across campus and you get victimized, what do you do? You, you call campus security, Tampa police may get involved, they conduct an investigation, they may apprehend the perpetrators, they arraign them, they try them, if convicted, they sentence them to time in jail or prison. What happens when a rock is walking across campus and gets mugged? Who does a rock turn to? There's no police for a rock to call. There's no investigation. So because the system is anarchic, it becomes a self-help system. Countries have to depend on their themselves for security. So the nature of the system dictates that it's a self-help system. And if you have to provide security, what do you need to require? <coughs> you need power. So power is central in realism. If you have power, you can dominate others. If you don't have power, then you're going to be dominated by others. So when we talk about power, a good definition of power that most international relations scholars accept is the ability to influence others. If you have the ability to influence others, you have power over them. How do we measure power in the international system? How do we measure power? And that's a trick question because it can mean different things, <coughs> right? One thing is that power is viewed in relative terms. And what does that mean? If power is viewed in relative terms in the international system, then you measure your own power in relation to someone else's power. Is that particular to realism or just in general? In, to realism. That's <coughs> particular to realism. So if, if you think about this, you know, the US and China have a trade relationship with one another. <coughs> Who benefits more from that trade relationship? <laughs> yeah, that, that could be debated. If the US concludes that China is gaining more from that trade relationship, then the US should not engage in that trade relationship. 
because in essence, what you're doing is helping another country become more powerful, relatively speaking, to yourself or your country. So the focus is always on relative gains. You know, when you drive and you're looking in the rear view mirror, <coughs> who's coming quickly at you? Who's ready to supersede you in power and perhaps engage in war or take you down? So you have to be very cognizant of that. Relative gains. The way states measure power is by capabilities, military capabilities. So the stronger military you have, the larger military you have, the more capable military you have, the more power you have as, as a state. Some other tenets that are important is that for realists, the state is a black box. So what that means is that what's within the state doesn't really matter. What's within the state doesn't really matter, whether it's democratic or authoritarian, how um, elites organize themselves, what the hierarchy looks like. Are uh, leaders elected or do they select themselves through the use of force or other means? None of that matters because for a realist, since states are rational actors, they're going to make a rational decision in the end. Doesn't matter what the process of making that decision is, we just accept the fact that they're going to act in their own self-interest. So that means it doesn't matter how power came to be? Uh, it, within the state, within the state. The, how elites came to power, that doesn't matter. That None of that matters. It doesn't matter if it's a democratic system or an authoritarian system, uh, a, a, a monarchy, a dictatorship, a junta, uh, lo que sea. It doesn't matter. It's a black box, and what matters are the actions that states take, the observable actions that states take. So within realism, we have a framework. We have a framework to try to, I hate to use the word predict, but anticipate the behavior of other states. If you assume that a state is acting in its own self-interest, you can kind of predict why it may be <coughs> acting the way it is acting. Uh, a current example is uh, Iran. You know, Iran is, uh, kind of nibbling around the corners trying to be an agitator with the U.S., attacking tankers that are in our interest, and now they're threatening to, um, to enrich uranium above the levels that were determined by, by the, you know, the treaty or the, the agreement. It wasn't a treaty because it wasn't ratified, but the agreement that it had with the Obama administration and others. They're trying to make the cost <laughs> of maintaining that agreement higher so that the U.S. has to act in some way and it gives them an opening to being able to get rid of those sanctions. So they're acting in their own self-interest in a sense. Can I ask a question about how, how do all realists define self-interest the same way? Like you think about economic self-interest versus like climate change, right? Like, what it, yeah, the, the self-interest is, is uh, capabilities, maximizing capabilities, the capabilities that make you powerful, whether that is your economic system, whether that's your military, whether that's your diplomatic core, it wants to build up the capabilities that makes you powerful. More often than not, for a realist, you're looking at military capabilities, you're looking at armed forces. But in order to have a strong <coughs> military, you have to have a pretty strong economy as well. You have to do well, because having a strong military is very expensive. 
So you have to be uh, have a, a strong economy as well. <clears throat> so that serves a state in the long run, having a strong economy. Um, when, when conducting, when, when trying to figure out what's in our best interest, I just want to throw this in there to make sure that, that, that I'm thorough here. Uh, states conduct, or actors, rational actors, conduct a cost-benefit analysis, right? When you guys decided whether to apply for the NEH uh, Summer Institute, you considered the benefits of attending, which hopefully were, 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 were you know, substantial, but you also calculated the costs of coming, you know, time away from your loved ones, <coughs> the actual monetary costs and uh, the time and cost. You know, staying a whole month here is costly. You know, it takes you away from other things that bring benefit to you. You guys all conducted this cost-benefit analysis, and this group decided that the benefits outweigh the costs. You acted rationally in a sense. Okay, so those are the tenets of realism, and realism has been around for a very, very long time. This isn't a new idea. Thucydides, in the Peloponnesian Wars, talks about Athens and Milos, small island of Milos, and how um, the, the, the military leadership of Athens gave Milos an ultimatum, ultimatum told them, Listen, we're going to make you a tributary of us. You're going to produce and you're going to give what you produce to us. And we'll let you live. And the Melian said, no, 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 that's not just, that's not right. Well, you know, morality and justice doesn't really matter to realists. It's all about power. And they told the Melians, listen, if you're powerful, you tell others what to do. If you're weak, you have no choice but to accept what you're told to do. And that is written back during that time. Machiavelli and the prince is giving very realistic advice, right? It's, it's better to be feared than loved. Uh, realism is pessimistic. Realism is pessimistic in the sense that it views human nature very negatively. If you're not careful, someone will victimize you. Given the chance, someone will victimize you. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and you have to stay on top of your game by continuously maximizing power. Continuously maximizing power which is measured in relative terms, okay? We call this brand of realism sometimes uh, classical realism or human nature realism. In the 1960s, uh, this, this scholar named uh, Kenneth Waltz came up with a new twist to realism. And what he basically uh, advocated for was that instead of uh, of, of focusing on human nature being bad, that you know others will, will covet what you have and will take what you have, given the chance, on the structure of the international system and the units within the structure. The structure is the system itself, and if you think of you know, a good analogy for this is a, a billiards table. The table itself, which is rectangular, is the structure. The billiard balls are the units. And the units are constantly moving around, just like states in the international system. How do states move around the international system? Their power increases and decreases relative to others. So for structural realism, it's about the distribution of power in the international system. And Kenneth Waltz uh, identifies three different distribution of distributions of power. The first one is a unipolar world in which you have one, one power 
one superpower that has more power than everybody else and dominates the system. You can have a bipolar world where you have two countries that share similar capabilities, similar powers, more than everybody else. And then you can have a multipolar world where you have a handful of great powers that, sh that, that share more power amongst themselves than everybody else. Okay? For realists, whether classical or neorealists, as, as Walt was, the structural realism is also referred to as neorealism, the, 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 the important actor in the international system are states. No other actor matters because no other actor in the international system can acquire power. So states are the only ones that matter because states are the only ones that can acquire power. Okay, yes? How would a realist um, address or explain when the state collapses? And going back to the idea that Joy brought up a couple of minutes ago, I mean, morals, values, they have to matter in the decision-making process because if we think about what happens in monarchies and they lost their power, right, because the people came together and they realized this doesn't make sense anymore and this is not just, we, we want, to a certain extent, power too, or we could probably even say um, equality, right? Or, or <coughs> Yeah, uh, morality matters to realists if it coincides with acquiring more power. If doing the right thing and becoming more powerful coincides, converges, then you do the moral thing. But in those situations where acting morally makes you weaker and being stronger being, means being immoral or amoral, then you do what it takes to make you stronger. So given the choice, you pick power over morality. But if you can, you, you, you would act. Will it be the same with corporations, for example? Uh, corporations are no, non-state actors. Cooperation. 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 Oh, the, the, no, 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 no. No. The only way you cooperate is if it helps you gain more. If, if you gain more than the other. So <laughs> China gains so much from trade. The U.S. gains so much. The U.S. shouldn't be trading because China gains more. So for China, that trade relationship makes sense because they gain more. For the U.S., it doesn't make sense. So you only cooperate when you come out ahead than the other actors. Read. You said that states are the only actors that matter in the system. But like, what? Um, who would it not matter? You thought that, you, what about like multinational corporations that are becoming, like, are, do, is the realist theory actually that, that like international multinational corporations aren't <coughs> actors? They, they, they are actors, um, and this is where realism comes up a little short. It really can't account because it's so state-centric, it's so focused on the state. Uh, a, a, a realist would view the relationship between multinational corporations and states as a principal agent type of relationship. Those corporations help advance the interests of the state. But are they also advancing their own interests? Yeah. Are they entering into the same sort of interactions of trade with nations? They do, they do, but realism doesn't account for that. Oh. Realism doesn't account for that. So so remember what I said at the beginning that you know that 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 you need multiple theories to really gain a good understanding of the international system because there is no one theory that helps us understand it all. Um, go ahead. So, the, so do these, does this kind of conception of state behavior reproduce itself that internally inside states? Or is this something that states are doing internally and then projected outward onto international relations? I'm thinking like in terms of the distribution of power and structural realism, like the unipolar, bipolar, multiple, so a lot of political parties and how they operate as well, and different within. The, so, are, is it that we're looking at international relations and then these same structures and distribution of power we see 
they reproduce themselves internally then in space? Because that's how we're looking at how states interact with one another? No, no connection. Interact? No connection between domestic and, and the international system. So, you know, there are the three images, right? First, second, third image. Uh, you, can, you can study international relations from the individual perspective, from the domestic perspective, and from the international perspective. Uh, this neorealism neo -realism is focused on the international perspective, how power is distributed <coughs> in the international system, regardless of domestic uh, attributes. I was just going to say, is it, <clears throat> would it be a measure of the, of the state's uh, primacy vis-a-vis -vis multinational corporations, no, in the sense that they're able to form uh, cooperative relationships that can be internally con uh, 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 contradictory. For, I was thinking, for example, Apple, right, or Google, <laughs> that they have one relationship, they have one operating procedure in the United States, they're protected by the United States, they're, they're within the umbrella of, the, of our government, but there's also Google China and there's Apple China that play a different game and, 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 and do the bidding of the Chinese government and so censor or, or control information in that way. So in that sense, they, they're not projecting power, they're, they're, uh, they're uh, con uh, what's the word? collaborating you know, with, with states. Right, the, the, the realist view, I believe, would be that you know, the, the state is the one that controls these multinational corporations. Uh, if, if, if Apple is headquartered in the US, <laughs> look at what's happening now in the US with, with Google and Apple. Uh, they're starting to want to regulate Facebook, Google, and Apple, and uh, you know the fourth one, I forgot which one, but the, the four tech companies, the biggies, uh, Amazon. So, you know, the U.S. It currently, you know, and, and interestingly, this is being led by Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats who have benefited from tech companies in the past. Now they want to regulate them. So the view is that Multinational corporations do what they do because the states allow or permit that behavior, those actions to take place. And if at some point that behavior, those actions no longer suit the states, they can regulate and control or maybe even have them <coughs> break up as is being discussed currently with these big uh, tech giants. But I see you guys are wanting to talk about liberalism and neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to cooperate. You guys, uh, you know, you guys are, 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 are not buying the realism, right? Um, so, liberalism focuses more on domestic politics. So where realism does, doesn't really concern itself with what's within the state, the inner workings of the state, liberalism does. And liberalism argues that, or, or at least Immanuel Kant at the time argued that liberal states are more cooperative, they treat their citizens better, they provide certain liberties and rights to individuals, and are there thus more peaceful than non-liberal states, and that they engage in trade more, they're willing to cooperate more. So under, under for instance, uh, um, democratic peace theory, Kant argues that republics are more peace-loving than non-republics. And we've actually tested this. You know, even though this was developed you know, by Kant uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s and, and into the 2000s, uh, researchers have looked at this, built large data sets of wars, and what they concluded was that liberal states engage in war 
just as much as non-liberal states. So the idea that liberal states are more peaceful doesn't bear out by the evidence. But coincidentally, something that did bear out. And what was that something? What did we learn? Chris, you're, you're, you've taken my class. You can't, you can't answer. <laughs> well, what did, what did we learn about states? <laughs> Democracies are, are, are not more peaceful or less prone to war than non-democracies, but they don't go to war with each other. <coughs> they do not go to war with one another. And you'll be hard pressed to find an example of two democracies going to war with one another. So there's something about democracies that doesn't necessarily make them more peaceful, but makes them more cooperative. <coughs> they tend to trade more with one another. Democracies also tend to join more intergovernmental organizations than non-democracies. They engage in more trade than non-democracies. So they behave differently than non-democracies in the international system. Now the question is why? But how do you account for civil war within that? Yeah, here we're looking at interstate wars. Okay. Just interstate wars, not civil wars. So that data set that uh, that Gar and I forget who else put together, uh, you know, they're they're just looking at interstate wars. So what is it about democracies that makes them more peaceful towards one another? <coughs> Here's where you know scholars have had problems trying to explain that. You know, we, we we have a finding, and you can't really offer a good explanation for this finding. <coughs> So what, what, are, what may be some of the reasons why democracies are more uh, or less prone to go to war with one another? We never say that they never go to war, but the truth is they, they really don't go to war. Um, so that, that, that may be the, the only law we have in international relations. The only law, the only absolute that democracies don't go to war with. Maybe because in democracies there's a, there's there are dissenting voices uh, versus another type of state where there, there's only there's only one uh, point of view, so there's space for negotiation. Okay, so compromise, consensus, yeah. deliberation. What happens in Congress? What happens in parliaments in Europe? They build the norm or norms of cooperation, <coughs> deliberation and getting along with one another. So when you have two states that build these norms, they're less likely to go to war with one another. Is it also because they share the same kind of internal assumptions about like... Same values. Right. Same like values. Like equal have rights. Absolutely. They, they, they share similar values, similar beliefs that they, they believe in individual rights. They, they believe in affording liberty to their citizens. And I would argue that this belief has now become global in the sense that the United Nations advocates for these same values for the most part. Human rights and you know the, 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 the human rights expanded beyond political to include economic and social rights. This is similar but a bit darker where I I feel like part of war and convincing a population to go to war really uh, is necessary to dehumanize the population that you're going to war against. And I think it's harder to do that with the, like a democracy to a democracy because it's the indoctrination of the citizen as a human, right? And that conflation between citizen and humanity that can, there's like more slippage for that if it's like not necessarily a democracy that it's easier to dehumanize that. Yeah, that may be true, but uh, democracies also use that same dehumanizing rhetoric when going to war. Right, but they can't. No, no. 
for each, each other, each other like same. that you they, it's hard to dehumanize someone right, just right. like you. Right, right, right. The two are going, but I mean, if you look at the uh, you know the drum beat up to the war against Iraq, you know some of the rhetoric that the Bush administration was using was very dehumanizing. That's exactly rhetoric. my point. Is that yeah. like you can do that with, but if to do that against democracy would mean saying that the yourself. citizen is not human, right? Exactly. The idea of like the citizen with the, the enfranchised citizen equals a human, right? Right, which like reflects a lot about who was considered full human and not full human in this country too. Right, which talks about values, right? Mm -hmm. It talks about values. Off of your point, it's also a lot easier to justify war if you can justify yourself as the liberator of the disenfranchised, slightly subhuman citizens of these other countries. As we keep bringing democracy to countries, whether <coughs> they you know, want it, want us, whether or not our system is actually democratic anymore, any of that, right? And so it's the, the like moral rectitude of the democratic nation that allows it to constantly invade other countries that happen to have the control of reserves. Right, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you're right. I mean, we, we you know, and, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is spreading democracy uh, beneficial, or you know, is it more peaceful? If you if you have more democratic countries, do you have more peace, less conflict? You didn't say that. Already. You said that. That democratic that republics are less likely to war with each other. Are conversely non-republics more likely to go to war with each other? They they go to war with each other as well, but at a, at a lesser rate as well. So so the, the same is true. There, for there, there, there is there so is. So like say authoritarians aren't warring against each other, and republics aren't warring against each other. They're all just fighting. They they the do other. they do, but less right. less. Yeah. So so there is this idea of authoritarian type of peace as well that's been kicked around. I mean, I like the way that uh, Elizabeth and Breyer frame this because it's it, uh, I. It's true that I'm having trouble thinking of examples of democracies going to war against each other, but I can think of plenty of uh, like covert aggression in the United States, you know, like, or like Britain, you know, has engaged in towards democratically elected leaders, but it seems like there's, if you're doing it sort of surreptitiously like under the table, then you don't have to worry about enlisting the population or like enlisting public opinion. Right. Right, because you wouldn't fear in the election of other democracies, right? And it's kind of ironic that you know we point to Russia saying stop, but you know we we, we, we have a long history of that behavior <laughs> ourselves. Yeah, so maybe you know we're not more aggressive, but we find other ways of, of uh, you know of pursuing our interests. What is the, what is the role of the um, the, the economy? Okay, so, so according to liberalism, liberalism doesn't put the same emphasis on relative gains. Realism, I told you earlier, measures gains in relative terms. You know, how powerful are you compared to the next guy? So when, under those terms, it's really in, inhibitive of trade. You can't cooperate because you're always worried that the other side gains more than you. For liberals, they view, they view gains in absolute terms. So a liberal, I, I mentioned the US and China as an example earlier. So a liberal would say, okay, we trade with China. China gains more than we, uh, we do, the US, from this trade relationship. <coughs> But you should continue to trade anyway, because if you don't trade with China, the U.S. gains nothing from that. So if you trade, we gain. So there is, there are absolute gains. So that's the difference in how they view gains, absolute or relative gains. And liberals view gains in absolute terms, which allows them to cooperate which allows them to cooperate more. There are different threads or strands of liberalism, but there's one that focuses on institutions, international institutions, as facilitators 
of cooperation. Why don't countries want to trade with one another? Why don't countries want to cooperate with one another? Because they fear that they'll be cheated. And if cheated, <coughs> there's no place to turn. You can't call law enforcement, you can't call uh, uh, you know, an agency to come look into it. There, there's no, uh, you know, nowhere to go. So states are very hesitant to cooperate because they fear being cheated. It's believed that these international organizations facilitate trade and cooperation in general because they minimize the costs of being cheated. So a lot of these intergovernmental organizations like the World Trade Organization have dispute resolution mechanisms built into them. There's accountability? Yeah, they have some type of accountability. So if you're if 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 you decide to, to join the WTO because it benefits you, because you'll trade more and become wealthier, you agree to abide by a certain set of rules. And if every country agrees to abide by the same set of rules, then that facilitates cooperation. And then these limited to institutions that are still have heavy associations with states, like so state sending representatives, yeah, these, these are, these are an intergovernmental organization is uh, an organization whose members are comprised of states. So like the United Nations, the World Health Organization, uh, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization. These are all international organizations whose membership are comprised of states. States join these organizations and they can be global like the UN, or they can be regional, like the Organization of American States. They come in all shapes and sizes, and you know they, they, they address different concerns. WTO is part of a trade regime. World Health Organization is part of a global health regime. Right, the, the, the non-proliferation treaty is part of the non-proliferation regime. So there are different regimes, international regimes, that are governed by these institutions and by international law, and they make cooperation uh, affordable. Okay, so that's liberalism. There's a brand of liberalism called neoliberalism, and neoliberalism accepts all the assumptions that neoliberalism makes and concludes that states are still better off cooperating than non cooperating. How many of you have heard of Prisoner's Dilemma? Yeah, Prisoner's Dilemma is a cooperation game, right? And it's used by you know, international relations scholars to get an understanding of why states cooperate or don't cooperate. So in, in the prisoner's dilemma game, two individuals rob a bank. Um, they're caught. And they're put in different rooms. You know, we've all seen Law and Order, right? Boom, boom. You know, one goes in one room, one goes in the other room. And the one goes, listen, man, your buddy's ratting you out. You're going to be home, you know, you're going to be doing the time, and he's going to get out scot-free. And he says, oh, shit, I better rat out the other guy, too. So they do, and then they both get stuck in the, with the larger prison term. Whereas, if they had cooperated with one another, and they both kept their mouths shut, they would both come out better. But they can't trust one another enough to do that. Because the fear is, I cooperate with law enforcement, and the other guy defects and throws me under the bus. So that lack of trust disallows states from cooperating. So you need these institutions, in the case of institutional 
liberalism to facilitate cooperation. And we've been talking about trade, but cooperation <coughs> can also be something like NATO. NATO's a military alliance, right? So this, this also delves into the security aspect. So now we understand why states may cooperate, sometimes, but not others, right? All right, constructivism is a, now both of these are social theories, constructivism and Marxism. Constructivism, I think, originated in sociology, right? And it's based on identity and norms. And it's beneficial for international relations, understanding the international system, because you know, the way that states are perceived may change over time. Right? You know, we've all had acquaintances or friends that we got along with, and then something happened, and now we don't get along with. The same individual was once an ally, and now it is a threat or a foe. Look at Japan. Japan in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, big threat, big regional aggressor. Look at Japan today. Doesn't have that same identity. It's perceived differently. So the identities that we attach to states and other actors may change over time. So that's important when you talk about international relations because you know you, you have changes of regimes changes of leaderships that may impact how states behave in the international system. Then the other aspect of this is norms, international norms. <coughs> and I'm, I'm personally a big believer in international norms. And what are norms? What's a norm? Custom. Customs. A standard. Laws. It's expected behavior. It's expected behavior. And I always tell my students, you know, when I walk into a classroom, the expected behavior is that the students are going to be sitting with their laptops open or their books out, their notebooks ready to be taking notes and, and listening to my great lecture. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't walk into a classroom and hear loud music and see everybody <laughs> dancing and grinding with one another because that's not the norm. The established norm is that students behave a certain way before class. Hopefully that doesn't change next semester. <laughs> but norms are expected behavior. So, it's important because we've talked about these international institutions that facilitate cooperation, that try to get states to focus on the gains and not the cost, not being ripped off, not being cheated. But the more that states cooperate through institutions, the more a norm is starting to settle and to sink in. So at some point, can we remove the institutions and still have that norm of cooperation in the international system? Right? So norms are expected behavior. And, you know, think about Prisoner's Dilemma. If you play Prisoner's Dilemma once, you'll cheat. You'll defect. You won't cooperate with your accomplice. But if you play Prisoner's Dilemma over and over and over again, if it's an iterated Prisoner's Dilemma, and in the international system, two states don't interact once and never again. They interact and they continue to interact and the possibility of establishing norms exist. So if you play Prisoner's Dilemma with the same individual enough times, you will eventually understand that cooperating with one another and not with the police will serve your best interest. 
and you'll establish that norm of cooperation because you've identified that other individual as someone that's willing and able to cooperate. Okay? Any questions about constructivism? Okay, let's move on. Uh, Marxism, right? Marxism, we all know Karl Marx, um, mi amigo Karl Marx, um, you know, focuses on class, differences in class. And this came around during the Industrial Revolution, right? You know, Marx was an observer of the Industrial Revolution in Germany and looked at it and said, oh my God, look how people are being treated. They're dispensable. You lose an arm, a leg, you're kicked out, and the next person in line takes your job. And he thought that it was exploitation. One class exploiting another class for profit. If you have to sell your labor, you're screwed. You're at the mercy of the wealthy, the powerful. Apply that to the international system. And do we have exploitation in the international system? Do we have one class of states that have more power than other states and exploit other states? You know, many people would say that the trade relationship between the global north and the global south, right? Global north tends, tends to be developed industrialized democracies. The global south tends to be developing countries that haven't industrialized or fully industrialized, that haven't achieved democracy or, or a political system that works for its own citizens, that can provide health care, education, and other necessities. If you look at how these, you know, the, the north trades with the south, what does the south export? Raw materials, right? Yeah, I'm sure you guys have heard this lecture more than once, right? And what does the North export? Finished goods. And those finished goods tend to sell more, for more than the raw materials. You know, I, I remember hearing Hugo Chavez back in the day, right? Hugo Chavez on one of his diatribes with, you know, saying a, a barrel of oil costs so much. A barrel of shampoo costs a lot more. What's more important to the world, a barrel of oil or a barrel of shampoo? In my case, obviously not shampoo, right? But you understand that there's a, a superficiality of, behind this, right? That the commodities are really what's important. They're the ones that drive the, the global economy, oil. But a finished good will sell for more. So that relationship, dependency theory, which was developed in Latin America by an Argentinian economist working for the UN, looked at this relationship and tried to figure out why do Latin American countries not develop? Why is it so difficult for Latin American countries to industrialize and develop their economies? And he concluded it's nothing that the unit is doing, it's nothing that Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia, and Chile are doing, that it's the structure that's been put in place that is behind the reason why developing countries can't develop. <laughs> There's this capitalistic structure that keeps them from developing. And it's there, intentionally put in place by developed countries that benefit from that structure. So that's dependency theory in a nutshell. Is that the, the, the economist or the theorist that uh, led to all the Latin American countries in the 60s and 70s attempting export substitution? And yeah. All that? Raul yeah. Prabesh. Raul Prabesh. Yeah. And then you also had Cardoso, who became president of, of uh, Brazil. And then Filetso was also one of them, mm -hmm. right? 
So, so you know, there's different strands, different variations of dependency theory, but Latin America did try to industrialize. You know, basically what they tried was import uh, uh, substitution, right? They figured, hey, we're importing all these finished goods. Why don't we just produce them ourselves? Obviously, there's a demand for them, and they tried to do that. And you know, to, to make a long story short, it was disastrous for, for various reasons, which I won't go into. I mean, basically, they didn't have the capital, they didn't have the investor class. People didn't want to invest their money. So governments had to borrow to build the facilities and became heavily indebted, which is another form of exportation. You get countries from the global south indebted to the global north, then they can make demands. Listen, buddy, you can't pay back your debt, so why don't you just sell your oil for less or allow American corporations to come and mine copper, or whatever the case may be. Someone had their hand up. Yeah, I, like, I'm personally kind of into dependency theory, even though I know like, a lot of people think it's kind of retro. But it's also interesting the way, like, the, the faith that it has, um, which is, uh, of, like, s in some cases, supporting, like, certain kinds of conservative, like, anti-worker policies, which in a sense is, like, every self-declared Marxist state sooner or later, like, engages in certain kind of anti-worker policies. And this, the same, like, because you mentioned Roland Frege, like, his, his fate is interesting. It, there, are like, there are Argentines who sometimes receive him as a conservative thinker because his work with um, uh, import substitution means that he a lot of times um, is like on the side of strike breaking. You know, when it's for like national industry. You know, uh, I don't know. It's, like, it's also like has like, lots of uh, internal contradictions. That's really or it just or it just segues right into say, well, on the one hand, this is a system that exists, you know, and we can either do something about it, or we can just accept that it's a doctor that world, and that's how it works. So right. Like, it kind of, it, it kind of facilitates both, depending on what you do with it. Yeah, or, or, or your perspective, right? Are you in the privilege. global south yeah. looking up and right. saying, damn, you know, we're being explored? How much or? privilege you have and how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Look, to your point about it. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. I'll go to you next. Do any of these, um, Theories take into account, or any like um, I guess data survey or study take into account when states were formed, like how close they are to a lot of times the legacy of colonialism that in some ways carved them out, and whether that changes the way that states relate to one another. Because it kind of seems like as we're talking about these theories and stuff, as if everything was formed at the same time, or everyone, you know, the, or the, the kind of sense way. of like this, or the same way, it's kind of spontaneous. Oh, and now suddenly it's. State, right, where some places uh, <coughs> like Israel or something has been created and right. was put into effect in a very different way mm -hmm. than Argentina. So, does are there ways of controlling for that? Yeah, yeah, you right? would control for something like that. You would control for you know a lot of uh, of the research, quantitative research, would control for how long a country has been in existence. For for instance, you know, control for something like that. Um, the international system as we know it was created in 1648. So the, 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 the modern international system of states is believed or said to have been created in 1648 by the Peace of Westphalia, the treaty that ended the Thirty Year War. The Thirty Year War was a, a religious war. You know, the princes in one area didn't like the religion that subjects in another principality or kingdom were practicing, so they went to war. After the end of the war, these countries said, listen, man, you know, why don't we just set some rules up? What my subjects do is my business, and what your subjects do is your business. And this idea of sovereignty was born. States have sovereignty. And what that basically means is that the government of a state rules over its citizens or subjects and its territory. And other states really shouldn't intervene. That, of course, gets violated for better or worse, right? 
Okay, so can we move on to an uh, overview of uh, world history? <laughs> a, a broad, uh, you know, quick overview of, of, of <coughs> world history. Focused on the U.S. because here we're focusing on the U.S. So prior to the Spanish-American War, you know, at the, the, the creation of this country, uh, we, we weren't a powerful nation. We were very vulnerable when we were first created. And Washington himself, in his farewell address, warned the country that it should stay away from the entanglements of Europe. Don't get involved in the political entanglements going on in Europe and focus on your own economic development. This country was very isolationist, very inward that began to change as we became more and more powerful, especially after we industrialized, right? In the you know, early 1800s, we went through this industrialization process and we developed a very strong economy and we became a very strong country. And I think the Spanish-American War is that benchmark, that, that determining factor you know, in its inception, this country had territories, right? We had Indian territories. We had territories that hadn't been formed into states. And those territories had people. What do we do with these people? Do we call them citizens and afford them the same rights as a U.S. citizen? Or are they something different, something less than a citizen? So those type of questions and concerns have been going on for a very long time. After the Spanish-American War, the U.S. attained foreign territories for the first time in its history. What do we do with those people? What do we do with those territories? What is an important question as well? Are they U.S. citizens? And of course, we, we fully understand that race is, was a large factor in these type of decisions, right? That we wanted to preserve our European stock in this country, for better or worse. So, isolationist or internationalist is a, 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 a dichotomous way of looking at this. But another dichotomous way of looking at the U.S. in its infancy, before the Spanish-American War, was its ambitions, as it became more powerful, it wanted to have a stronger role in the international system. And that debate had been going on for the latter part of the 1800s, led by folks like Teddy Roosevelt and uh, Henry Cabot Lodge and others that believed were becoming powerful and powerful countries acquired foreign territories and we become international players and we act in our own self-interest using our power. But you also had those that believe that we're a democratic country and we have to adhere to certain values. And one of those values is that people have the right to govern themselves the right to determine for themselves how they're going to be governed. And they believe that acquiring foreign territories and controlling foreign people was anti-democratic. So you had those that valued democracy and the, and the principles of democracy, and others that wanted to attain more power and become uh, active in the international system. Just a, a question of clarification. You say that 1898 was the first time that the U.S. as a country acquired foreign territories. How are you differentiating that from, like, the Alaska Purchase Right, right. Those were more accessions. <laughs> right, but those, those were acquisitions more than, than the spoils of war. Right? And those didn't come to us through war. We, 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 we believed in manifest destiny, but 
only to a certain extent. Is the phrase that is a little bit more apt, like contiguous versus non-contiguous? Alaska's not contiguous. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Well, what about I agree. The, the Mexican American War, 1848. Um, that was already. Okay. Right. 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 But but again, uh, you know, the, the, that was continuous. The U.S. So we expanded westward. There's no doubt about that. The difference is we didn't make the territories uh, acquired in the Spanish American War part of the United States. That's body. the previous. That is that is the absolute. Rule. Not all of them, right? Or, or yeah. Well, not part. I mean, Puerto Rico is not a state of the United right, States. Right, we didn't right, just be like, but, you know, but, these but, are part of our country. We, we did story. acquire right. Hawaii, not not mm -hmm. directly as as a result of the Spanish American War, but more or less about the same time. Right. And we did make them into a state, right? So, so and then we'll come back to that, we'll come back to that. So, so there was this dichotomous between upholding our democratic <coughs> values or becoming powerful and attaining territories and showing ourselves to be a powerful country in the international system. Obviously, those sentiments won out and we intervened in the Spanish-Cuban American War. But that sentiment didn't stay alive much longer, right? We didn't really acquire more territories. You know, we won two world wars. World War I and World War II, we could have easily acquired more territories. We could have taken the territories, you know, the colonies of of, of, of the countries we had defeated, the European powers. And we could have become a, a colonial master. You know, we could have had an empire a la Great Britain, but we didn't. We didn't do that. Instead, we decided to rebuild Europe. We paid for the rebuilding of Europe after World War II. After World War I, we attempted to be more internationalists. Woodrow Wilson, in his um, what is it, 14 points, decided that we needed this international organization called the League of Nations that would serve as collective security. The great powers would in intervene when war or aggression took place and they would stomp it before it got out of hand, before it became another world war. But the U.S. Senate didn't ratify that. And the U.S. never became a part. Even though it was the brainchild of a U.S. president, the U.S. never became a member of the League of Nations. It did form and it did intervene in the Armenian uh, genocide, for instance, but without the leadership it didn't, it didn't last. So we became isolationist after World War I, instead of you know, taking a more active role. After World War II, we didn't make the same mistake. After World War II, we rebuild Europe. And why, why would we rebuild Europe after World War II? I mean, is that, what would a, 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 a realist have said about that? Why the hell are you helping your, 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 your adversaries? Yeah. But we realized that we needed allies. We realized we needed markets for our goods. So we rebuilt Western Europe in our own image. We rebuilt Japan in our own image. And we created the international institutions to facilitate a liberal economic order, a, a, a system of, of free trade. The Bretton Woods institutions, created even before the war ended, were put in place to facilitate trade and, and monetary policy. We created the World Bank. We created the International Monetary Fund. There was an intention to create the International Trade Organization, never materialized, but an informal organization emerged, General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, GATT, which was informal, wasn't ratified by any country, 
but countries began to, 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 to meet and to negotiate and to reduce tariffs on trade. And through different rounds of negotiation, free trade blossomed. And then in 1995, GATT was formalized into the World Trade Organization. So in essence, under US leadership, we created the international institutions needed, or NATO as well, to facilitate cooperation both on security and economic matters. Is um, this, it's not imperialism because the, in the first and second war, the uh, United States decided not to acquire its territory, but did do these rebuilding, re reconstructions uh, in the United States image. So can we call it hegemony? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say the, the U.S. Was, was, was a hegemon, absolutely, and uh, you know, we also have to understand that what emerged after World War II was a bipolar system, <laughs> right? A system that we've never seen before. We had seen a multipolar system before in Europe, the Concert of Europe, which kept the peace in Europe up to 1914. Mm -hmm. Then it collapsed. You know, and part of that collapse was the, the end of empires. Four empires uh, faced their demise after World War I, one of them being the Russian Empire. And one of them, like, what, 15 years previous to that? 17 years previous to that? Yeah, Spain. exactly. So five. And, and then what emerged in Russia in 1917? So certainly this is a, an amazing triumphalist, exceptionalist, story of the U.S., um, this trajectory uh, is it's amazing and something that we will have to highlight. But then, at the same time, it is putting the basis for the continuation of these hierarchies that are set to continue. We have a Marshall Plan, which is going to rebuild uh, Europe, but there's nothing for Latin America because we do want those guys to continue producing raw material. So we need, so we got that backyard cover and everything is going to continue the same. And then on the other hand too, the United States is going to be reactive to the fact that yes, this is a bipolar world. So it needs to accommodate to that. This is my system. I need to expand my spheres of influence. And this is another ball game going on. So it's commun communism and so forth. Exactly. So you have two ideologies right. that are vying for, for supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. Capitalism, a free market capitalist type of uh, uh, a laissez-faire system, right. and then a command and control communist uh, system. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're competing, right? They're competing for influence and, 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 and supremacy. Mm -hmm. Then. In 1989, we see the, the Berlin Wall come down. In 1991, we see the Soviet Union collapse. We won. We're number one, right? At that point, capitalism and democracy win. And, you know, folks were writing that, you know, this is the end of history. That's it. The story's over. But, of course, you know, the story wasn't over, right? Then we start seeing... Uh, ethnic and regional type of conflicts breaking out, etc. Okay, so today, uh, are we still, are, 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 you know, I, I would argue personally that in the 1990s, the U.S. could have been considered a superpower. Uh, uh, it, it was a unipolar system with the U.S. squarely on the top. Whether it's that today, I have reservations. And, but, but, you know, there, there are different points of view, of course. You know, we can all conclude different conclusions. So, so that, that's basically an overview of, uh, of history as, uh, as I'm going to present it. So what I would like you to do now is separate into four groups using the four filters and give an analysis of what's happened to the U.S. after the Spanish-American, Cuban-American War, and let's see what type of understanding we can get from applying the four different theories. And my guess is that 
if we take them all together, we can have a pretty clear understanding of what's happened since you know, Teddy Roosevelt led the charge up South Florida Hill. So, uh, so let's separate out in groups. Uh, if you're to my left, you're group one. If you're to my right, you're group two. <coughs> group three, Marcia. Group four, Liz. Okay? Group one, group one, you're, you're going to analyze the rise of the, of the U.S. in the global <coughs> stage through the filter of realism. Group two, you're going to do the same thing through the filter of liberalism. Group three, constructivism, and group four, uh, Marxism slash dependency. Okay. And now it becomes like a, I don't know, like it becomes backed up by the city. And, and you were asking us to, to come up with, you know, the Marxist approach. And that's what I said before. I mean, from the United States perspective, that's probably what it was. It was the bigger guy, you know what I mean, looking for new markets, American capitalism. Now I think there's another story to it in my research that I found out, and I'm probably saving that for the for the presentation. <laughs> that that is not, it's not as simple as it looks, uh, and there's a lot of rhetoric and there's a lot of uh, stuff that is not being taken into account. And somebody was making we we're talking about the territories. I mean, mm -hmm. Anugo and I have talked about you know what happened in in, in Cuba was a little <coughs> bit different from what happened in Puerto Rico, right? And what happened in the Philippines. And the Philippines, you know, the, the Filipinos, which something that really surprises me, is they established a, a, a guerrilla warfare. Most Americans don't even know that that happened. Yeah, but they really fought hard for their yeah, independence. And, and they were massacred. Mm -hmm. You know, right. this liberal democracy, that and, and, and that, that whole self-determination, the rights of people to, you know, we used, we massacred people that were trying to fight for their And nobody was telling me that in Puerto Rico there was an independent Movement also, right? Mm -hmm. With well, the it was, it was uh, at the same time in Cuba, in Grito de Lara, it was at the same time in Grito mm -hmm. de Lara, mm -hmm. uh, in 1869. There was not a military movement uh, in the 1890s, it was before that. Uh, so it was uh, another period of time, it was like 30 years before that. But it was at the same time as the Cuban ones. Okay, let's see how we're doing on time. I, I wanted to talk about Latin America more specifically because, uh, you know, Cuba becomes communist. And all of a sudden, communism rears its ugly head on our hemisphere during this Cold War with another great power, and it freaks us out. And we start supporting strong men and training paramilitaries to kill off any homegrown insurgencies that may arise. And of course, what we know is that, you know, that that's completely. Um, um, <coughs> exploited by these strong men and they use it to kill off their their political enemies etc but let's not get into that uh, what, what, what I'd like to do instead and I think that you know what Jose and, and others have said will, will lead us into this is uh, you know the Spanish American war the US gains external territories we gain Puerto Rico Cuba the Philippines and I'm going to throw in there Hawaii, just because we gained, yeah, well, I'm, I'm just a rock in the uh, So is Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii is a pretty rock. Uh, so so, so we, we annex Hawaii around the same time, even though it's not directly uh, linked to the Spanish American War. So, so what's happened to these, to these countries slash territories? Puerto Rico remains a territory, a colony. Cuba <coughs> negotiated its independence. And you know, the Teller Amendment had a big part of that, but you know, they, they, they put pressure on the US to, to adhere to it and to leave. Philippines had to fight. And after defeated, you know, years later, we grant them their independence. We like, killed you all, and now we don't want you anymore. Yeah, and, that, and, and, and Hawaii is a next. So which one fared better? If we talk about development, you know, we're talking about uh, economic and political development. Political development is usually 
taken to mean democratization. If you're, polit if you're developing politically, you're becoming more democratic, less authoritarian, more liberal in a sense. Economic development means you develop your economy from an agrarian economy to an industrialized or technical uh, economy. <coughs> How do we measure economic development of countries? How do political scientists and other scholars measure the economic development of a country? GDP per capita, right? That's one measure. And GDP per capita measures the state, not the individuals within the state. In the last 20 years or so, there's been an emphasis of looking at security, not as the security of the state, but the security of the individual, human security. We use indices today to measure uh, human security and human uh, development, economic development. We use what's called the HDI, right? Human Development Index that was, um, that was developed by the, 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 I think the UN uh, Development Program developed the Human Development Index. Uh, we can also talk of inequality within countries. Equal societies, societies that share more equality, tend to be more peaceful, less violent societies. Do we have a measure for equality within a country? Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient. Who said that? The what? Kevin? Gini coefficient. G? Gini. G I N I. Oh. G I N I, Sorry, I think coefficient. I like so. If we were to look at these indices for Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii, which country has fared better? So group one, why don't you look at these indices for Cuba? Group two, the Philippines. Group three, Hawaii. <laughs> group four, uh, Puerto Rico. What, like now? Yeah, yeah. That's what Devices, you know, I've done that professor in a long time. Just Google it. And then here, your source manager, uh, World Bank data, is a long time. We have to have some kind of mentor, right? That's people that we can do. <laughs> Philippines, Hawaii, and uh, Puerto Rico. Tennis, you forgot the happiness quotient. Oh, you want to throw that in there too? All right, and why don't we throw in the, the, the Transparency International that also looks at corruption, levels of corruption. So, what's that? Transparency International. That's how you know that's what we're talking about. What is the one for inequality, guys? Gini coefficient. And then uh, someone also mentioned, what was the other one that you mentioned? The GDP. No, 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 right now, right now. Someone Transparency said. International. Transparency International. Gini. I don't know. Gini. I thought that was the first one. Transparency International. Gini. 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 Oh, oh, the happiness. Gini measures. Uh, there is a happiness. Inequality. It measures inequality. I have a GDP. But for happiness, what's the name of it? It's called the happiness. It's called the happiness. It's called the happiness. Oh, we have well, we'll see if Puerto Rico has something to be happy about. If it's, uh, yeah, just being happy for no reason. For what?